we do not live in a golden age of a digital era. And Facebook, Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, Amazon, they see a lot about your digital life, but they actually don't see your real life. And similarly, telecom operators, banks, they see some pieces of your life, but they don't really see what matters to you. And not what matters to you is your values, your family, your hopes, and your dreams. None of them know your true self. And although they can infer a lot using the data that have been collecting about you over the years, they don't really know that you have kids, or they don't really know that you want to swim more, or they don't really know that you have been eating too much chocolate tonight, and that you're going to be sick tomorrow morning, and that you knew that when you were eating the shot chocolate before. <coughs> they just don't know it. Two things. One, they see a fraction of your life, and they even see a fraction of that fraction, because they barely share data between each other. Two, our interactions with these tech giants are rather simple, commercial, passive, because they are based on data that are just a side product of our interaction when we, when we passively consume the services. My message tonight is that we do not live in a golden age of a digital era, but are rather at the beginning of such an era. And we have moved from the tech chaos of the 1990s to a tyranny and an oligarchy with towering tech giants in the year 2000s. And we need to be much more ambitious when it comes to technology, and we need to move towards a digital democracy and a data democracy over the coming decade. We need to move from a commercial era to a much more political era. And my work is to design and build bridges and make sure enough people use these bridges. Bridges between rich and poor countries. Bridges between tech and non-tech people. Bridges between different data sources and problems and solutions. And we need to increasingly link different fields together, but it is increasingly complicated to do so. Physics, mathematics, literature, art, culture, sociology, economics, technology at large, politics, philosophy. They look very divided and very different, but they actually are just different looks at one, one single world, all world. There are three things I want to share with you tonight. One is that we, knew, we do not do things in a vacuum or in isolation. And there is a very personal debate around why do we do what we do, which is at the core of every of our decision. We do what we do because of our history, because our missing pieces. And in my case, a desperate need for love and an immense curiosity for our world. And similarly, we cannot cut technology from, on one side, the cultural and social context, and on the other side, the philosophical, historical, and political context, and from the entire society as a whole. Two, tech people need to be much more ambitious. We need to think bigger than us. We need to dramatically raise our game when we talk about technology and data. Tech people tend to focus on technical elements, and they believe they are revolutionary, while they massively disregard other dimensions. And my work is to use artificial intelligence technology to improve our world and to allow people to make better decisions. 
And we've, we've been trying to do that over the years by linking the data, the technology, and the social and cultural context. And that was our first step. But that's only a first step, an important step, but just a first step. We still miss the link between te technology and the philosophical, political, and historical context. And that leads to my third point, which is that tech people need to build bridges, but non-tech people need to use these bridges. They need to start exercising their digital rights, the new rights, and more importantly, become digital citizens. We massively live in a world that we do not own and that we didn't shape. And we are approaching a moment where we will need to decide whether we want to tilt back the power of technology to the people and move to a democracy, a digital democracy. And if so, what type of democracy do we want? Every year, I go to almost 15 tech conferences, usually sitting between two people, passionately talking about technology. And frankly, I'm bored to death. I just don't give a damn. Because I don't care. I like and love culture, art, philosophy, literature, fashion as an art, not as a business. And I always wondered why I love what I love and I like what I like. I had a great childhood, loving parents. But one thing, I was adopted at birth. I had missing pieces, gaps. But I was lucky enough to meet my biological parents again. And everything was again clear to me, finally. I finally understood why I love what I love and like what I like, because I got the context, I got the history. And similarly, we keep taking decisions for our future on technology and many other things without looking at the context. And my life is a modest metaphor for my talk tonight. Technology happens in a complex world, and we need to recognize that to know where we want to go next. And that leads to my second point, which is that we terribly miss tech people of capable of telling stories when it comes to data and technology. We have been linking technology, tech giants, and the social and cultural context. And that was the idea when we started using big data and artificial intelligence for social impact. Trying to build large-scale impact for entire communities. And not only for niche needs or for rich people. And concretely, we use telecom data to eradicate diseases. We have been developing tools, algorithms, dashboards, during and after the Ebola crisis in West Africa, during and after the Zika crisis in Brazil. And we went to a point where we could identify people and track people individually just looking at the telecom data that they generate using their phone when, when, they, are car when they are walking around. <coughs> Similarly, we use telecom data to identify all the women in Bangladesh and Uganda. And what for? To allow social and international organizations and local governments to empower these women, socially and economically. We even use telecom data to see whether you have a job or not on entire countries, just looking at your social network. If you have a job, you have friends. If you don't have a job, you don't have friends. Sorry, guys. 
And if you have friends, you call them and they call you. You have a rich and dense social network. We use satellite images and telecom data again to identify poor individuals, but also to advise farmers to predict whether there's going to be a food crisis in a country or a region. We developed all these amazing tools, but we developed platforms as well with other tech giants and with other giants as a whole to build stories that are bigger than us and them. These giants are, for instance, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the Rockefeller Foundation, but also the telecom operators, Facebook, satellite operators. And we need to do that ethically, because ethic matters. <coughs> ethic matters because there are two side products to ethics that are very important for our societies. Trust and privacy. Imagine a world with less trust and privacy. That means less critical mind, less innovation, less empathy and less forgiveness, because in a world where everything is predictable, you're not going to forgive anyone for what they did. Because if they knew the consequences of the act, they shouldn't have done that. Hence, you don't forgive. What I mean here in my message is that we need to be much more ambitious when it comes to tech people. They need to embed legal, and ethical elements into the technology. And if they cannot do the job, somebody has to do the job to link all these points together. That was what we were trying to do. Was it enough? No, it was not enough. It was not enough because you still don't own your data. You still don't control your data. Your data is still with these tech giants, with Facebook and Google of these worlds. But that's okay, because we built a story that is slightly better and slightly greater than them, and than us, by the way. But still, you don't control your data. And that leads me to my third point, which is that technology has helped us to solve our daily problems over the last 3,000 years. And it all started in Greece, where people live in an environment closer to paradise. They were ruled by kings, gods, and nature. Amazing life. No responsibilities. No responsibility for their actions, no responsibility for their life, no responsibility for their destiny and their fate. Everything was in the hands of the gods. Until Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle came up. And they literally saw their world collapsing under their eyes. First, the Persian Wars, then the Peloponnesian Wars, etc. And any change was a bad change for Plato. But at least people started having responsibilities for their actions, not for their destiny. The destiny was still in the hands of the gods. But the actions were there. Then technology kicked in, the printer, big thing. Smart people started challenging and being challenged. Rational thinking came up, logic showed up. And people, amazing people, I would say, like Luther, Calvin, Marx, Nietzsche, and many others, they killed the gods, they killed God, they created a world where human beings were complex, full of passions, and back at the central of the stage. They had responsibility not only for their lives and their actions, but also for their destiny. They could finally shape history. We are not at that stage yet from a technological perspective. Not at all. <coughs> far from it, I would say. And far from it because people didn't individually engage with technology yet, and massively. We, we started a project that we called Data Democracy, and the aim of that project is very simple. It's to 
give opportunities to individuals to share the data with whoever they wish for whatever cause they want and whatever data types they want. For instance, you would share your data with the city of Brussels to reduce the traffic jams in exchange for Spotify access, free access. Great, right? And you can be even more crazy than that because you can think about sharing your Facebook social graphs or your LinkedIn social graph or your bank transactions or your telecom data, but much more than just your call. And we went to talk to people. We had panels and we tried to understand, are people ready? What do they think about that? And basically what they told us is that they see their relations with Google and Facebook as lost battle. How inspiring is that, right? Lost battles. But there is hope because people told us that they were willing to proactively share the data for a great story and trust. So my message is that we need to be much more ambitious for tech people, but we need also to be much more ambitious for individuals and citizens. We, you, are going to live in an entire new society in a few decades from now, where you're going to be able to share your data with whoever you wish. It's going to be very different. The tech giants of today is going to, are going to be dead or they're going to change. There's going to be probably less polarization in the society as well, because you will finally be politically engaged in the digital world as well, and massively. Today, only extreme people are engaged, and extreme opinions are engaged. But what does it mean for you, for us? What does that mean? I want to take one sentence of Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. At the end of the first scene of Hamlet, he makes Hamlet say the following, just a short sentence. Time is out of joint. Who cursed spite? If ever I was born to set it right. What does that mean? Translating the ideas of the 17th century into 21st century language, that means essentially two things. One, if ever I was born to set it right, means that your actions matter individually. You're going to have an impact on the entire society only if you massively engage. Two, time is out of joint, means that at every generation, the world is about to collapse. And it's the responsibility of each generation to set back in track, to avoid a catastrophe. Because each generation has to deal with a bomb. My grandparents had to deal with the consequences of the fast industrialization and two world wars. My parents had to create a safe world and avoid nuclear devastation. My generation had and has the responsibility to deal with a demographic bomb. And your generation has the responsibility to make sure we still have a planet in 50 years from now. And my kids, they will have, they will have the responsibility to understand what makes us human in an increasingly complex and sophisticated digital world. And that's going to be super complicated. It's answering a 3,000 years old Greek question about what makes us human. And they have 50 years to do that, and there is no way out. Nietzsche helped us because he allowed us to test the limits of our power, individual power. But Heidegger helped us as well because he gave us a few solutions. One, you need to understand what existence means. Two, you need to understand what to be means. And these are probably some of the keys for these two guys to save us, all of us. My ID worth spreading is that we need to be much more ambitious when it comes to technology. 
but we need to build more bridges, many more bridges, to foster democracy and to reach a kind of digital democracy. We need to, mo to move being digital consumer and becoming digital citizens. Thank you very much.